All right. Thanks, Sydney. I'm glad to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, OpenACC and accelerating HPC applications uh, with OpenACC. Um, so let's just dive right into it. Um, if you have not heard of PGI, you can think of us as NVIDIA's HPC SDK. So we have Fortran C and C++ compilers that support optimization, SIMD vectorization, OpenMP for multi-core CPUs, uh, MPI interoperability for scalable systems, and GPU support with CUDA Fortran, which you heard a little bit about yesterday and I'll explain a little more about today, and OpenACC uh, directives. Uh, supported on x86 CPUs plus Tesla, open power CPUs plus Tesla on uh, Linux, and on x86 on Mac OS and Windows as well. Um, so uh, programming GPU accelerated systems. If you, if you have not programmed a GPU accelerated system before, uh, one of the basic things you need to understand is that, that uh, the CPU has its own memory, which is typically larger and latency optimized. Uh, the GPU has its own memory, which is uh, very much higher bandwidth, typically five to 10 times higher bandwidth, um, and bandwidth optimized, but with very long latency. Uh, and then connecting those two memories um, is a PCI bus, which is um, a pretty good I.O. bus. It's not a great memory bus. And so it's very, very slow compared to either the system memory bandwidth or the uh, GPU memory bandwidth. And you as the programmer, are responsible for moving data back and forth between that system memory and the GPU memory. Um, and in recent GPUs, NVIDIA's introduced the concept of NVLink, which when that CPU is an open power CPU, uh, which also has NVLink, is a much higher bandwidth connection. It's closer to the bandwidth of CPU main memory uh, but still, the programming model is, is unchanged. So the transfers between those two memories are, are faster, but you as the programmer manage that data movement between uh, system memory and GPU memory. Um, and, and in CUDA, uh, that's very explicit. And this is a, another example of CUDA Fortran, which uh, Josh Romero went through briefly yesterday, but if you've never uh, seen CUDA Fortran or a CUDA program, uh, you can imagine uh, stepping through this. Uh, the host code in CUDA Fortran looks very, very normal. It just looks like uh, Fortran with a, a very few extensions. Uh, one of those is the device attribute. So if you declare an array uh, with the device attribute and allocatable, uh, you're stepping through your program and you allocate a dev and B dev and C dev, those will be allocated in GPU memory instead of in host memory. Uh, then when I uh, perform an assignment statement from a variable A to A dev, the device copy, where A is, is just a normal host array, data movement between host memory and device memory occurs. And so uh, rather than making API calls like you would in a CUDA C program, you just uh, move data back and forth with variable assignments. So it looks like normal Fortran. Uh, likewise for B, uh, the Chevron syntax to launch a kernel is pretty much identical to in CUDA C. Uh, so I launch uh, with a, a given grid size and, and thread block size uh, and start executing this kernel, which I've declared again with an attribute that specifies to compile this program unit for device side execution. And the code itself in the kernel, I can put things in CUDA shared memory, again, with an attribute. Um, I calculate where I am in the grid in the same way I would in a CUDA C program. I go through my loop, I can synchronize, so on and so forth. Then I'm back on the host. Um, I move the result from the device array, the device copy of C, into the host copy. Uh, I can deallocate my arrays, and then on I go. So it looks very much like normal Fortran, but it's explicit. And you, the programmer, uh, you, you carve out what was a loop into a CUDA kernel. You manage the data movement back and forth between host and device memory. Um, and so it's, it's low level and explicit. And as Josh said, you have control of all the resources on the machine. And uh, there are times when that comes in very handy. Uh, one of the, the features that we added to CUDA Fortran is the concept of a cuff kernel directive, which again, he spoke about yesterday. 
uh, if you've ever written a reduction in MPI that is completely general, uh, you know that's a very complex thing. Uh, to handle all of the edge conditions for any uh, potential loop extents takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of bookkeeping, and that's what compilers are good at. Uh, and a cuff kernel directive allows you to, to put a directive over a tightly nested loop that says, take these next two loops and automatically turn them into a CUDA kernel. Uh, those asterisks say, whatever the loop bounds are, I want my thread block size to be 32 by 4, so you calculate what the grid should be and, and launch the kernel. And the equivalent handwritten CUDA kernels are on the right there uh, in two-point font. And so you can see that, that uh, it's a big improvement in, in productivity. And, and there are a number of applications that are coded mostly using just cuff kernels and host side uh, device and, and and so on and so forth, variable attributes. Uh, so that's CUDA, it's explicit. Uh, OpenACC is what we're gonna talk about mostly today. Uh, and, and it was designed uh, in order to allow people to access the power of a GPU in a model that remains fully portable to other compilers, other systems. Uh, and so it's a directive-based model that uh, is in the style of OpenMP, but, but with a somewhat different philosophy. Uh, so there are directives that allow you to manage that data movement. Pragmas in C and C++, special comments in Fortran uh, that specify when data should move between host memory and device memory. There are uh, directives that allow you to initiate parallel execution, and that could be across all the cores on a CPU or for offload to the GPU. Uh, and there are pragmas that allow you to fine tune how that loop is scheduled. Um, and it's incremental in the sense that you can profile a large application, uh, go in and, and find hot loops and functions, and parallelize and offload them incrementally. It's designed so that you can have a single version of your source code that, that can compile with uh, an OpenACC-enabled compiler or a non-OpenACC-enabled compiler. Uh, for both CPU and GPU, it's interoperable with CUDA, it's interoperable with OpenMP, it's interoperable with, with MPI, uh, and designed to be performance portable. And this is a, a, a difference between, in philosophy, between OpenACC and OpenMP, is OpenACC gives the compiler a lot of latitude on how it uh, schedules loops on a given target, whereas in OpenMP you specify uh, directly how that schedule will occur. And it's designed certainly to enable GPU acceleration of applications, but in a way so that that code can be parallelized across all the cores of a multi-core or many-core system as well. Uh, so that's uh, what it looks like, just to, to set in your mind what uh, a program looks like. Again, if I'm stepping through a program and I hit a data region uh, that says uh, move B uh, into, uh, into device memory before the region. Uh, it will create space for A and B. It will copy B from uh, the host memory into the device memory. Uh, a is create, which means it's a scratch array in device memory. So uh, it doesn't actually initialize it. And then it proceeds into this for loop, which is a host side for loop, uh, which has a, a parallel kernel uh, inside of it, and it will parallelize and offload that to the accelerator. So it will compute this smoothing uh, by offloading this kernel to the GPU and operating in GPU memory. Then there's a copy from the A space in GPU memory to the B space, which is a separate kernel. And then I'm just in a host side loop around two GPU kernels. So I do a smoothing, a copy. Uh, again, eventually I get to the last iteration, a smoothing, a copy. And now I'm done, so I'm going to exit my region. And at the exit of that data region, it will copy B back over to system memory, deallocate device memory, and, and on I go. So, so that's the basics of OpenACC. These data regions can be hundreds or thousands of lines long. They can span call trees. Uh, the loops can be very long and complex. But that's the basics of, of how the programming model works. Um, 
And as I said, uh, this concept of data movement is built in to allow you to write uh, portable code that will compile and run on GPUs, but you can compile that same program and with the PGI compiler, the option is dash TA for target accelerator equals multi-core. And the compiler will just split up all the, the work across all the cores in the system. Uh, and since it's a shared memory, no data movement is required. And, and keep that in mind. Remember that option. Uh, and remember this concept that we're just expressing parallelism in the program. We have the ability to express data movement, uh, but on a shared memory system, it can be ignored and the model is designed uh, to support that. Whereas if you compile it targeting a, a Tesla GPU, uh, again, the compiler will parallelize those loops, generate an accelerator kernel, uh, and tell you exactly what the loop schedule is for that uh, given loop. And then you can override that decision with, uh, with uh, clauses on your parallelization directives if you need to. Uh, so how does it work? Um, well, it works pretty well. Uh, there are a set of benchmarks from the uh, SPEC committee um, called SPEC Excel that have been available in OpenACC for a while. There are 15 different codes. Most of them are a few thousand lines long. Uh, one of them is a, a pretty big application. Uh, and you can compile all 15 of those for parallelization uh, across all the cores of a dual socket Broadwell with 40 cores. Geometric mean of the execution time is about 125 seconds. <clears throat> and that exact same source code, parallelized and offloaded to one Volta V100, uh, is about four and a half, half times faster on average. So a, a big, big speed up. And this is the kind of thing that people get really excited about. In the most recent version of these benchmarks that came out last summer, there are also OpenMP 4.5 versions, uh, which can be parallelized today across all the cores of multi-core CPU, so it's the same 15 codes, but written in OpenMP instead of OpenACC. Uh, and eventually, those will be, uh, uh, compilers will be able to parallelize and offload those OpenMP 4.5 versions to GPUs, but today we can use them to compare the same codes with a PGI compiler on a Skylake or an Epic or a Broadwell to an Intel uh, 2018 compiler on those same systems. And you'll see PGI is not quite as fast as Intel. So uh, Intel is five or 10% faster than PGI on average on all those benchmarks on a Skylake and a Broadwell and, and about the same on an Epic. Um, but you'll also see that that Volta is um, close to three times faster than on average than all the cores of a dual socket Skylake. And, and we've been showing uh, benchmark numbers like this for a couple of years, and they're very compelling. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, open ACC applications development going on, and, and you know, kind of the big news in the last year or so is the number of uh, big, important applications that have been GPU-enabled using this model. And uh, uh, Ryan is probably still out in the audience, and he's going to shoot me at the end of this talk because... He does not want to see these applications live forever. Um, but part of my job is to, to help them uh, continue to be viable. Um, one of those is Gaussian, uh, which is, has been in development continuously for about 40 years. It's two million lines of code, uh, used at about 3,000 sites around the world. Um, and, and the process of, of GPU enabling this code uh, took a few years. It started a few years ago. Um, and the quote there from, from Mike Frisch um, gets across the, the key point here, which is over that course of several years, they were able to do continued development of the code on the platforms they support already uh, simultaneously with GPU-related work. Uh, and in the end, they have the exact same code base plus some directives for SMP systems, cluster systems, and uh, GPU parallelism. Uh, and, and so this is uh, an example of a, a really important, very widely used application um, that is, is now GPU accelerated, and it takes a lot of work to do this. But because you're able to do it incrementally and remain portable uh, to other compilers and systems, uh, it makes it feasible to, 
to bring applications like this uh, onto platforms like NVIDIA GPUs. Um, Ansys Fluent um, also uh, released a version that was GPU accelerated with OpenACC about a year ago. Uh, this is an interesting case uh, in that um, it was probably mid to late 2015, we got a bug report from uh, the Fluent team at Ansys and uh, we got very excited and, and called them and said, oh, is there anything we can do to help you? No, no, we're fine. Um, and, and the same over the course of six or eight months and, and then they had a problem porting to Windows, uh, which we stepped in and, and helped them with. Um, but this is a case where one of their developers took an online course, learned how to use OpenACC, started experimenting on their code, had some good results, and a uh, year and a half later, uh, the radiation transport solver in Fluent uh, was GPU accelerated in a production release of their software. And since that time, they've uh, extended that to other parts of the code and, and moving that GPU accelerated version to, uh, to other platforms. Uh, VASP, uh, this is a project that started a little over a year ago. Uh, this is not yet in production. Uh, there is a uh, GPU accelerated version of VASP available that is coded in CUDA C. Um, and uh, they ended up, it's a Fortran application, it's relatively large, um, uh, with the problem that, that the CUDA C was very effective, but they ended up with two copies of their source tree, one in CUDA C and one in, in Fortran. And, uh, and maintaining that and bringing the CUDA C forward was, uh, was a challenge for them. So they decided to do a port, uh, a trial port with OpenACC. And in the, in the end, uh, when, when the OpenACC port uh, of those um, parts that had been coded in CUDA was complete, um, the performance of the OpenACC version was actually a little faster than the CUDA version, not because OpenACC is faster than CUDA, but because once that work was done, they were able to quickly offload a number of loops that had not been offloaded in the CUDA version, and they were working on a much more current version of the source space that had algorithmic improvements that, that improved the performance. And so this is not released yet, but you can see there from that quote from Georg Kressa that uh, OpenACC is now their strategy for GPU acceleration of their code. Uh, Numeca, uh, you may not have heard of. There's a company in San Francisco that uh, partnered with Dresser Rand uh, on a code called Fine Turbo on Titan. And uh, in order to do simulation of um, some carbon capture and utilization and sequestration uh, codes that, that um, Dresser Rand has, and with really, really good results. And, and Oak Ridge, uh, credits Numeca uh, with the ability to allow one of their industrial customers to do uh, work that they otherwise would not have been able to do. They, they were able to get 50x speed ups on Titan uh, over uh, the systems they were currently using and it made a big difference in, um, in their problems. And this is a code that is written fine open in C++ and uh, David gave a, a really great talk at GTC last year, which is online, which uh, I really recommend you watch because it, it, it goes through how to use OpenACC and C++ uh, using modern features of C++ but writing kernels uh, in a way that can be GPU accelerated with, with OpenACC and it's a, a really interesting case. Uh, MPASS is a next generation uh, weather and climate model that's in development at NCAR. Um, in this case, uh, they have so far only created a, the dynamics portion of this code, but uh, on that dynamical core, they're seeing a 2.7x speed up on one P100 over uh, all the cores of a dual socket 36 core Broadwell system. Uh, and now they're uh, MPI enabling that code so that it's uh, can run an MPI plus OpenACC mode, and so I think soon we'll see uh, results from two and four GPUs on a node, which um, should be really, really compelling. Uh, Cosmo 
was one of the first success stories with OpenACC. This code uh, runs in production. It was mentioned by DK Panda yesterday. Uh, so it runs doing uh, production forecasts for uh, Mateo Swiss. And, uh, and it builds and runs with either the Cray OpenACC compiler or PGI OpenACC. It's the Cray compiler that builds the version that runs in, in production. But with PGI, their partners can compile and run uh, on non-Cray systems, which was very important to them. Um, and, and you'll see here, again, uh, the dynamics in Cosmo uh, uses a, a DSL and C++, but the physicists need to be able to continually edit and work on the Fortran, and so uh, they decided to use OpenACC for the physics portion for that, that reason. Uh, Gamera is an uh, earthquake simulation code um, that has won a, a best paper award at the Accelerator workshop at Supercomputing two years in a row, and, and they're now gearing up for runs on Summit, the new system going in at Oak Ridge. Um, I assume this speed up is good. We asked them, uh, you know, what is the performance relative to a Xeon? And, and they said, well, we don't know. We just run on the K computer. And we were able to port to OpenACC, and this result is really great for us. So they. For them, they, they don't even think about the performance relative to CPUs. They just think about the performance of problems they run uh, relative to the K computer. And they get uh, really impressive linear speed ups going from one to two to four uh, voltas on a node. Uh, and then Quantum Espresso is not an OpenACC success story, but it is a directives success story. There is a version of, of Quantum Espresso now that is GPU accelerated almost entirely with the Cuff Kernels directive. Um, again, with, with really, really good speed ups um, uh, on the order of uh, four or five X uh, for a single P100 over um, a dual socket node. Um, so all of those ports have been done, again, with user managed data movement between host memory and device memory. Uh, and some of those are really large codes, and some of those ports took a while. Uh, one of the exciting things that is happening is um, the ability to, to take advantage of CUDA unified memory, which gives you uh, a view on that right-hand side there, or your left-hand side. You see that original picture of separated host and device memories. Uh, CUDA unified memory, uh, the memories are still physically separated, of course, but in the CUDA driver, um, on Pascal and Volta hardware, uh, there is support for uh, the GPU to directly read and write host memory and, uh, and to page memory from uh, back and forth between um, host memory and device memory. Uh, so you can allocate a single pointer with a, a certain CUDA runtime call um, that can be accessed by either the host or the device and and it's not accurate to say that, that it's demand paged back and forth. That's um, sort of insulting to CUDA unified memory, which gets better and better and better at each release. Sometimes over NVLink, uh, you will read and write individual date items out of system memory from the GPU. And sometimes you'll pull pages back and forth. And sometimes blocks of, uh, of up to a megabyte will move back and forth. And they're continually optimizing this. And, uh, what this allows us to do in OpenACC is to intercept C malloc and C++ new and delete and Fortran allocate and deallocate and map allocatable data in your program to CUDA unified memory. Um, and, and when you compile in that way with a certain compiler option, uh, when you get to the point uh, in, at runtime, where the runtime libraries would normally move data back and forth between host and device memory, if those runtime routines see that that data is in CUDA unified memory, they just don't move it. They let the memory manager move it back and forth. So for existing programs with data directives, those data directives will be ignored. Uh, but really, the point is that you don't have to put them in at all for allocatable data. And so just like on uh, compilation for a multi-core system, if your data is allocatable, you can just focus on exposing parallelism in your algorithm, uh, expressing it in your program using directives, 
and let the CUDA Unified Memory Manager handle the data movement back and forth between host and device memory. Uh, and so you're asking, you know, does this work? Um, and the answer is, is it does, or I wouldn't be telling you about it. Uh, on Summit, there are 13 applications being uh, ready to run on that system. Uh, one of them, uh, GTC, is a fusion energy research code uh, that is pretty much ready to go. Um, and it's been ported um, to OpenACC uh, for GPU acceleration for a while. And so uh, for, at, at supercomputing last year in November, we did an experiment where uh, we removed all of the data directives from that code. It turns out that all of the significant data in the code is allocatable. So uh, you can literally compile it and run it with no data directives. And, and then compare that time to running an open ACC mode with user-managed data movement. And that's the, the data directives time you'll see there. Uh, so this code running on all the cores of a 20-core uh, Power 8 in pure MPI, which is the best configuration uh, on the CPU, uh, runs in some time. Uh, on two P100s with unified memory, it's a little over 6x faster and with data directives a little under 6x faster. Uh, and that's a repeatable result, and it, it carries over to the four GPU number. We don't know exactly why. If we run this same experiment on a PCI system on x86, unified memory is a little slower. Um, but the, the uh, best guess is that there is data from one region that is left on the GPU, which uh, the data directives are moving back and forth, but doesn't need to be moved back and forth. And it just remains resident on the GPU till the next region. And so you end up with less uh, data movement overhead. Um, so this code scales really well. And, and again, this is uh, an indicator that unified memory, when your program is, is structured well, uh, can work really, really well. And we didn't make any changes to the code to adapt it for unified memory. We just in this case, deleted the data directives. Uh, so deep copy. Um, if you aren't familiar with this problem, uh, this data management back and forth between system and, and GPU memory, uh, again, there's uh, you know, a lot of promise in unified memory. But today, uh, most of the work is still uh, with the user managing data movement. And, and you can imagine an array of allocatables um, and copying that data from uh, the host to the device, and, and if those are pointers that, uh, that you allocate data in, copying that array to the device memory, you're going to end up with pointers to host memory, which doesn't work. And deep copy is just the concept that you will fix up those pointers during the data movement so they then point to uh, the right data in, in device memory. Uh, and in VASP, um, you know, the, the data structures in some of these codes get very complex. In VASP, there's a five-level deep derived type um, that has three dynamic members at the top level and a derived type, uh, which itself has uh, 23 members. 21 of them are dynamic and two are uh, derived types, uh, and on and on and on. So it's a very complex uh, data structure, and you can imagine managing this moving back and forth can be complicated. With CUDA Unified Memory, uh, it should be really easy, right? You just let the memory manager move it, but uh, in derived type three, the members are static, and CUDA Unified Memory today only works for allocatable data. So, so in VASP, in the current port of VASP, this data management has to be managed uh, by the programmer. Now, in the future, there will be support for uh, global data, static data, uh, stack data in CUDA Unified Memory, but that's not there today. Um, so in that case, you have this deep copy problem. There are really three solutions. Uh, either uh, you can do what is called full deep copy, where the compiler and runtime cooperate to fix up those pointers and just copy the whole derived type over. But if you're not using all the elements of the derived type, that can be very, very wasteful in uh, GPU-side memory, which is a fairly precious resource. Um, 
The other option, which is supported today, and this is how it's done in VASP, is using uh, manual deep copy, which is part of OpenACC 2.6. And in that case, um, you can declare uh, aggregates, um, and you essentially have a, a set of fairly uh, uh, verbose directives that you have to use to uh, create copies of those in the device and then manually move pieces of them back and forth. And it, it's, uh, it can end up generating a lot of directives, but it does work, and it's uh, fairly straightforward to implement. Uh, the, the OpenACC committee is working on uh, OpenACC 3.0 true deep copy. And this is a case where you could just define in the definition of the aggregate a policy uh, that should be used, uh, and these can be named policies to copy just parts of that aggregate um, in either direction or, or both directions. And then you just issue a, uh, a data copy directive and the copy occurs according to the, the policy. And so this is um, where things are heading from a, a directives standpoint. And we're pushing in both of these directions so that uh, you know, we need to take advantage of, of CUDA unified memory wherever we can but you always want the programmer to be able to take control when they know uh, better. So, so where is this all leading? Um, where is OpenACC leading? Uh, Cloverleaf is a fairly well-known mini-app from the Atomic Weapons Establishment in the UK. Um, and you can see there, uh, if, you, if you run the BM32 test problem on a single Haswell core compiled with the Intel compiler, <clears throat> it runs in some amount of time. Uh, Multicore Haswell in OpenACC or OpenMP is about the same, likewise for Broadwell and Skylake. Uh, and then this, this program scales incredibly well on multiple GPUs. And so that all of those green bars are the exact same source code running on all the cores of a multicore server or on uh, multiple GPUs. And if you look inside of this code, uh, a typical loop looks like this. So the, the do loops are declared independent by the programmer. There's some private data that's declared, uh, and that's what the body of the loop looks like. And if you compile it for execution on a Tesla, the compiler will offload those kernels. Um, if you compile it for a multi-core processor, uh, again, the compiler will uh, do various optimizations and SIMD vectorize the loop, but the source code looks exactly the same, okay? Um, but where, where all of this is going is that if you think about Fortran 2018, you can just write that as a do concurrent loop or a do concurrent construct. And, and the body of it doesn't change at all. Uh, it can become a do concurrent uh, again, this code operates on allocatable data, uh, and we've built it using unified memory. So imagine unified memory working for all classes of data, and imagine a compiler being able to parallelize that do concurrent loop, either for multi-core execution or for GPU acceleration, and uh, dynamically driving execution to the processor where it runs most efficiently. This is... Uh, the way OpenACC was designed to allow you to use fewer and fewer directives as heterogeneous hardware and system software and compilers become uh, more and more capable. And so um, this is what you'll see coming from us uh, in the future. I'm not going to give you a time frame for that. But OpenACC gives you a clear path to the use of parallel features in, in standard languages. And uh, with that, I will finish up. Um, Josh mentioned the community edition. You can download uh, for free the PGI community edition and, and try these features out yourself, and I, I encourage you to do that. With that, I'll stop, and happy to answer a few questions if there are any. Yes. It, the, there, there is no best one. So Damien is here to advocate for Fortran, and Fortran has a lot of advantages in terms of being a high-level language, and the compiler knows a lot about your program. 
it, it knows that an array is an array, for example. Uh, they have descriptors, and, and so it's able to do certain things and optimizations that you can't do in C. Uh, but you know, all of these languages have their proponents and their pluses and their minuses, and, and I'm not here to really advocate for one over the other. Well, uh, so, so OpenACC, like CUDA, um, was designed with GPUs in mind, okay? So, so your program needs to be massively scalable with very limited synchronization in order to take advantage of a, a GPU. Um, if you have a program that is, is only modestly parallel or requires very, very elaborate uh, synchronization and and that kind of capability is available in OpenMP. You know it may be more appropriate for a more modestly parallel system. And you'll hear from from Nvidia that GPUs are designed to to perform really really well on a certain class of applications. But but there is no claim that they they perform on every application better than a CPU. Uh-huh. So the, the, um, the, the places where uh, people end up getting really significant speedups in CUDA over OpenACC are where they're able to make clever use of CUDA shared memory. The cache directive in OpenACC is very implicit and it's proved to be kind of challenging to implement. And so oftentimes a programmer in CUDA can use shared memory much more efficiently. Uh, there is no concept of constant memory in OpenACC. Um, and as Josh said yesterday, uh, clever CUDA programmers can do uh, you know, warp level programming uh, on a GPU that you just can't do in OpenACC. It's not designed to allow you to do that. So in those cases, uh, you, know, you can drop into CUDA and and see better performance. All right, thank you very much.